In the celebrated Gulf of Naples, ranging from Procida to Ischia, from Capri to Vesuvius, an extraordinary panorama greets the eye. Rising out of the northernmost point of the Gulf of Naples, the visitor is struck by the amazing sight of a fertile hillside emerging from the sea. Situated along the Italian coastline, Monte di Procida, a simple promontory, is rooted in an antiquity that evokes deepest and unexpected emotions. Viewed from the sea, the same sea that nurtured its ancient dwellers and forged them into a life of hard but enterprising work, it is a land that has left its tradition and its people to this day. Here we are at Aqua Morta, literally translated as Dead Sea, an explosion of beauty and history in whose waters, legend has it, a fabulous queen died. With its splendid sea and easy access to the Isles of Procida and Ischia, the area is today a favorite summer destination, but long ago, it was patrolled by the naval fleets of Kuma and Syracuse, guarding the region against enemy attacks from the sea. At the time, the Kumani, and later the Romans, were strongly interested in the fertile and fish-rich territory. And when Miseno became a colony of the Emperor Claudius, the place assumed the name of Mons Misenus, where nearby Miliscola, one of the most famous military schools of ancient Rome, sprang up. The ancient military importance of this coast, as evidenced by the little delicious isle of San Martino, is today a heaven for boats and bathers, but once was used in many wars as a strategic defense position. In the subsequent centuries, the area was abandoned, but then slowly repopulated, finally assuming around 1200 the name Monte di Procida, the name of the nearby island Procida, whose inhabitants had always been culturally and traditionally linked to the mainland folk and from where most Monte settlers came. Towards the end of the 19th century, migration from the island to the Monte di Procida accelerated, swelling the population, obliging many to leave and find work elsewhere. At first, there were the immigrants destined for America and Algeria, and then, embarking after them, the fabulous Procidian sailing vessels that sailed as far as the Terra del Fuego in South America. Thus, new riches for the development of the region began arriving, stimulating initiatives by local businessmen, merchants, and contractors. This newfound commerce only served to increase the region's desire for autonomy, which was recognized on the 27th of January, 1907, when Victor Emmanuel III issued a decree declaring Monte di Procida a self-ruling municipality. One of the region's busiest and most often visited places is Torre Gavita, with its alluring beach that faces the Isle of Ischia in the west. Here, one can admire the fantastic sunsets and amble along the jetty at any time to enjoy the sea breeze or sip an aperitif or dine on the seafront in one of the many fine eating places found. The beach, easy to reach via the Kumana Railway, one of the first built at the beginning of the last century, has for years been the destination of bathers who descend in swarms during the summer to find relief in its refreshing water. The place, also noted for its ancient fish market, was the first pier ever built for the little steamers vying from Procida and Ischia. It was said that fishing was the sole profession that developed during this first century of the region's recovery, but agriculture thrived also, and today remains an ongoing and important source of income that includes celebrated wines like the Falangina from the Campi Flegere and the Piedi Rosso that often is not become quite famous. Bearing witness to this vintage tale are the antique cold storage cellars of volcanic tuff 
where still today is produced and kept that which at the time the ancient Romans referred to as Nectar of the Gods. Even the art of wood shaping is practiced here. And you see families of carpenters and wood craftsmen busily producing artisan furniture of worth. And a very interesting school of ceramics, descendant of the region's mythical tradition, is developing. Noted for its strong traditions, it's only natural that the religious influence is very much felt. In fact, few districts of Italy can boast of an antiquated devoutness so profound and stimulating as found in the Flegrea region. From prehistoric time, the life to come was localized here, and to the inhabitants, the Monte Hill was considered an Eden reserved for blessed souls. One of the most ancient of necropoli, where normally military personnel of the Roman imperial fleets were buried, still exists in the Capella district. It was here that Jove conquered the Titans and the Giants. Here, Aeneas, accompanied by the Sibyl of Cuman, came seeking his father, Anchesius, shadow. Here, Pluto reigned in his subterranean kingdom, where existed a mysterious cult and Sirius's daughter, Preserpina, was married off to Pluto. So it's quite natural, especially in the summer months, that an area with such tradition lend itself to the proliferation of feasts and popular village festivals that culminate the 15th of August with the procession of the Holy Assumption, patroness of the region who since 1816 has excited the inhabitants onto the streets like a river in full current to follow her, visiting all the churches and quarters of the territory. This festival touches not only the inhabitants, but affects even those tied to the region by origin and tradition, like the many descendants of the old immigrants who carried with them the devotion towards the Holy Madonna to the other side of the Atlantic, and returned to their native land, contributing economically and participating in the organization of the festivities.
The expansion of the youthful population has favored the growth towards modern entertainment establishments that transform serene summer nights into an animated and energetic swarm of young people searching for fun. Another important tradition is that of gastronomy. In fact, the eateries that draw customers coming from every part of the region are famous and in Monte di Procida one eats very exceptional meals. From classical pizza to celebrated sea specialities of the house. But this expansion of the youthful population has also favored the growth towards mythical fast food served up by modern establishments, recognizing that young people are looking for meals that go beyond the classical sandwich in order to delight in a different and appetizing culinary experience. One such gastronomic pleasure, an American creation, the cheese steak, is composed of minced meat, cheese and vegetables, This is the love I'll give to you alone. More But for the more traditionalists, there is no scarcity of new high-class restaurants where, relishing a splendid candlelight dinner in the best of traditions and ambience, you are sweetly seduced for one night as participants in the mythology of this magical region. We move on to the opposite side of the large bay and reach the mysterious area of the Campi Flegrei. It is a vast territory with a volcanic character that includes numerous sites worth a visit. Here we are in Pozzuoli, a town made famous by frequent seismic phenomena known as Bradisismo that raise and lower the level of the land, often with catastrophic results. Judging from the mollusk shells found up to seven meters high on columns of the ancient Roman Serapis, these have occurred since ancient times. The columns are located in the center of the town on the site of an ancient market. Another famous place in Pozzuoni is La Solfatara, an area whose smoky, wild aspect gives a good picture of what the underground volcanic nature of Campania is like. The Solfataras are high temperature emissions of watery vapor mixed with carbon dioxide and sulfur. The Solfatara in Pozzuoli is inside a dormant crater with a circumference of about two kilometers. The atmosphere here is reminiscent of Dante, with a black terrain that boils up with mud and vapors, indicating it is alive and threatening. It is easy to understand why the ancients believed that this was the entrance to Hades. Here we are in Cuma, one of the oldest of the ancient Greek colonies in Italy. 
It was founded by the Chalcidies in the 8th century BC. Today, the archaeological area is rich in ancient monuments, including the temples of Jupiter and Apollo on the Acropolis. Its fame is due to the presence of the famous ancient sanctuary, the cave of the Sibyl Cumana, mentioned by Virgil in the Aeneid. It was considered one of the most respected and feared oracles of antiquity. Not many places in the world have so many famous areas in such a limited space as does the Bay of Naples. It is full of history, art and culture, all in an extraordinarily beautiful setting. Our journey begins in Naples, a city with a thousand faces whose praises have been sung throughout the world. The most celebrated panorama can be enjoyed from Via Orazio. Beneath us is the Mergellina port, animated with hundreds of boats and the uninterrupted traffic of hydrofoils taking visitors to every part of the Gulf. Further on is another port, Santa Lucia, with famous hotels lining the Via Caracciolo. Finally, there is a symbol of the history of the city, the Castel de Loro, a splendid medieval castle that is perfectly preserved like many other monuments in the city. Here we are in Piazza Trieste and Trento, the heart of the city. There is Via Chiaia with the Gambrinus, the most famous cafe in Naples and a favorite haunt of artists and intellectuals. This is the Galleria Umberto I, an important meeting place for Neapolitans. This majestic solemn structure rivals the splendor and elegance of the Galleria in Milan. Just in front of us is the famous San Carlo Opera House, inaugurated in 1737 and still one of the leading theatres in the world. Piazza del Plebiscito is one of the largest and most imposing in Italy. It is dominated by the splendid Palazzo Reale, the residence of the Bourbons until 1860. The facade is spectacular and the sumptuous interior is embellished with numerous frescoes and other works of art. There are many other places worth visiting in this magical city, including the Museo Nazionale, which houses one of the world's most important collections of ancient Roman art. Many of the works are from the excavations in Herculaneum and Pompeii, while others come from the former collections of the Farnese family.
Another large castle dominates the center of the city, facing the port. It was built by Charles I Anjou and rebuilt in 1442 by Alfonso d'Aragona. The Castel Nuovo, commonly called the Maschio Angioino, is still one of the symbols of the city. It is imposing and perfect in its powerful medieval style. A short distance from the Maschio Angioino is the Piazza del Municipio with the Carthusian Monastery of San Martino. An imposing historical column stands in Piazza del Gesù Nuovo, next to one of Naples' favorite churches, the Basilica di Santa Chiara. Its interior is in the Romanesque style and its famous cloister is decorated with Maiolica. Another of the city's pearls is the 18th century Reggio di Capodimonte, with its world-famous ceramics factory. We end our visit to this marvellous city in one of the most intimate, enchanting spots, the beach at Mare Chiaro, where the celebrated view of the Gulf and Vesuvius never fails to amaze the visitor. It is the place where the well-known Fenistella, by one of its most renowned poets, Salvatore di Giacomo, represents another legendary aspect of Naples, its music. The fame of the Bay of Naples is not restricted to a visit to the city. There are other famous places nearby that will please any visitor. One of the most celebrated excursions is to Vesuvius, especially to the ancient city buried by a tremendous volcanic eruption 2,000 years ago, Pompeii. Life there was halted in time by the terrible eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. But the city, once one of the most splendid and flourishing in southern Italy, has preserved a miraculously intact image through the centuries. Today, after a series of exceptional restorations, it displays all the magnificence, art and technology of a world that seemed lost forever.
there is the Temple of Apollo. The Basilica. And the huge forum dominated by the Temple of Jupiter. And then there are the baths, which were much frequented at that time. The temples dedicated to various gods. Two superb theatres where plays, ballets and musical spectacles were performed. The immense amphitheatre saw the Pompeians cheer for their favourites. Above all, there are the legendary dwellings that after centuries of restoration offer a unique, wonderful experience of life in a distant world. The House of the Fawn, with its renowned statue of a dancing fawn, was one of the largest and most luxurious in the city. The dwelling was adorned with extraordinary works of art, including the famous mosaic that covers an entire room. It depicts one of the battles in which Alexander the Great defeated the Persian king Darius. This remarkable masterpiece is made of millions of pieces of small colored tesserae. Another famous dwelling is the house of the Veti, that belonged to two very rich freed slaves, who became wealthy merchants. The villa is extraordinarily well preserved and contains some of the most beautiful frescoes in the city. Finally, we come to the most famous spot, the Villa dei Misteri, a large suburban dwelling located north of the city in a splendid panoramic position. At the time of the catastrophe, it had been transformed into a large commercial farm. What has made the villa famous throughout the world are its frescoes. The most famous consists of one of the most extraordinary painted murals from antiquity. They represent an amazing spectacle covering three walls that portrays the important moments of a sacred ceremony related to the cult in honor of Dionysus.
we resume our journey in Sorrento, another town that is world-renowned. Looking out over the deep blue sea, it is surrounded by olive and orange groves and has one of the most imposing tourist and hotel structures in Italy. Legend says the town was the home of the mythical sirens and it still preserves interesting memories of its ancient history. But what strikes the visitor most is the extraordinary air you breathe here in a climate of peace and beauty that merits its nickname of graceful. Continuing our journey, we enter another legendary coastal area, that of Amalfi. It consists of 50 kilometers of narrow, tortuous roads, built, like many other important works around the Bay of Naples, by the enlightened Bourbon kings who ruled Naples for more than a century. Our first stop is Positano, one of the most famous towns. Just a handful of colorful houses atop a high cliff that plunges down into the sea. Amalfi, the town that gives its name to the entire coastal area. Probably founded by the Romans in the 4th century BC, it was once the oldest maritime republic in Italy and slowly assumed great importance in sea commerce, becoming a maritime power around 1000 AD. The city issued a series of laws, the Amalfi Tables, that for centuries defined maritime commerce in the entire Mediterranean. One of its noted sons, Flavio Gioia, is said to have invented the compass. work of art is the cathedral, dating back to the 11th century, which is built in a beautiful hybrid Arab-Norman style. Ravello, a tiny but spectacular town. It was founded most probably in the 6th century, but reached the height of its splendor in 1200. The place certainly merits its fame. Its stupendous location, 350 meters above sea level, ensures a fresh, healthy climate, combined with a very special atmosphere of peace and tranquility. 
Its churches, including the cathedral from the 11th century, provide a touch of art and antiquity. And its extraordinary villas indicate the importance and wealth it achieved while offering visitors one of the most extraordinary panoramas in Italy. Here we are at Villa Ruffolo, which dates from the late 13th century and is adorned with towers and cloisters in Arab Sicilian style. The villa offers even more exciting images. There is a marvelous hanging garden facing the sea and a breathtaking panorama. It even bewitched Richard Wagner, to whom a local music festival is devoted. He found inspiration here for several of his immortal operas. already mentioned that the Bourbon kings were great art patrons. The kings who governed Naples from the beginning of the 18th century until the unification of Italy were distinguished for their love of art and beautiful objects. It is no wonder then that when Charles II decided to build a dwelling, he did not hesitate to launch a gigantic, very ambitious enterprise. He selected the place, Caserta, near Naples, a pleasant place well suited to his beloved hunting, and entrusted the great architect Luigi Van Vitelli to build a palace that would be the envy of Versailles. The palace, which has 1,200 rooms and 1,800 windows, is five stories high and immersed in a spectacular park more than three kilometers in length. The park is adorned with a colossal fountain decorated with splendid marble sculptures and fed by an artificial cascade receiving water from a 40 kilometer aqueduct built for the purpose. The spectacle continues with a visit to the royal apartments. They seem to bring back to life the magnificence and wealth of a legendary era. There is the audience room, the large frescoes, the huge chandeliers, the valuable furniture, the furnishings, the bedroom and the bathrooms with hot and cold water. This richness and pomp exist in an artistic equilibrium and good taste that takes one's breath away.
Of course, you can't visit the Bay of Naples without a visit to the famous islands nearby. We are flying now over the most famous one, Capri, a small island, but one that is so beautiful it has been visited and loved by the most famous people in the world. We'll begin our tour at its most famous spot, the Blue Grotto. Returning to the port, we take the cable railway to another legendary stopping place for the jet set, Piazza Umberto I, the renowned Piazzetta, that has been called the theatre of the world. The best thing to do is to avoid the crowds of tourists and walk up the charming narrow streets that lead to new discoveries. There's the Castle of Castiglione. There is also the Charter House of San Giacomo. We can find a moment of peace in the gardens of Augustus with the steep Via Krupp leading down to the Piccola Marina. Soon, 
Our visit ends with a splendid ride in a chairlift to the highest point on the island, Monte Solaro, where we have a spectacular view of the island and another of its symbols, the Caraglioni rocks rising from the sea. Always considered the Cinderella of the Neapolitan islands, Procida seems to do everything possible to remain outside the chaotic flow of international tourists that has made its sister islands famous throughout the world. The island has always had a discreet, modest existence, as if reluctant to show off its natural beauties, which are many and fascinating. The spirit of seafaring has always been part of the lives of the men of Procida. And the most famous sailors in Italy trained and sailed from here. These men of the first order plowed the seas of the world. It is an unusual island that hates and refutes worldliness and knows how to offer enchanted spots and moments of relaxation to those who desire to get away from the crowds and the stress they produce. We end our journey to the Bay of Naples on the last of the three islands, Ischia. With an exceptional tourist structure featuring 300 hotels in all categories, the famous Green Isle offers everything the most demanding tourist can desire. There are exceptional beaches, pine groves and parks, gently rolling hills and even a small mountain, Epomeo. There is an exclusive social life and quiet spots even in the middle of August. And there are the famous thermal bars that have made Ischia one of the most pleasant and efficient health spas in Europe. 
A visit begins with the port of Ischia, the bustling hub of the island. Tranquil is Ischia Ponte with its renowned Aragon Castle that rises where Geroni of Syracuse had previously built a formidable fortress. Another famous resort is Casamicciola. But at the end of the 19th century, Casamicciola experienced such a terrible earthquake that for Neapolitans, its name alone signifies an unavoidable catastrophe. Today, the earthquake in Casamicciola is only a memory, and the town is famous for its hotels, a beautiful commercial and tourist port, and renowned artistic ceramics makers. This centuries-old activity has made the island's handicrafts famous. Continuing our journey along the marvellous coast, we come to Laco Amenu, which was little more than a fishing village in the early 1950s. However, it was the arrival of Angelo Rizzoli, the important publisher and a patron of the island, that made it a centre of Italian social life. short distance from Laco, nature is again in control. We're in San Montano, another of the famous spots on the island. It is a small, charming inlet, enclosed by a beach with numerous swimming pools, lots of greenery and the sea everywhere.
on to Forillo, perhaps the favorite town of tourists looking for tranquility. Here the guests want nothing to do with deluxe hotels and swimming pools. They want respect for the harmony of the place where the simple indolence of the inhabitants can express itself in all its affability. Forillo has always remained the same. Wide beaches such as San Francesco and Chitara, and a large port surrounded by simple, clean hotels and locales for the young and the not so young. It is all about the sea and ample sunny beaches. It also has one of the most extraordinary thermal centers in the world, the Giardini Poseidon a complex consisting of numerous thermal pools at various temperatures in a spectacular setting on the beautiful beach of Chita. Finally, there is Sant'Angelo, an extraordinary seafaring village that has few equals in Italy or abroad. It is a tiny, friendly port surrounded by a group of colored houses. This microcosm of peace and tranquility, with its extraordinary beauty, allows time to stand still. Travel is slow, whether on foot or on the mules of long ago. The journey across the island ends at Ischia Ponte on the night of Sant'Anna, the most famous festival on the island. 
Tonight, the entire population is celebrating as they await the wonderful floats that will solemnly pass under the majestic silhouette of the castle. Each float will be decorated in a distinct and magnificent manner, depicting reconstructions of scenes from Neapolitan life. The spectacle is very entertaining and the perfume of the sea, even though interrupted momentarily by festive fireworks, is always strong in the air. Like the recollection of this marvellous part of Italy that celebrates nights like this with a pinch of nostalgia.